to welcome all of those watching online tonight, Kings Community Live and, and Facebook Live. We're so happy you're here. I want to start with a testimony tonight. Who wants to hear a testimony tonight? Yeah. Good. I like the response. Listen, the Lord is doing some amazing things, and you get to be part of it. And it's not just here in Jerusalem. It doesn't just stay here in the city. What you do, King of Kings, is impacting the world globally. I know you don't always feel that, but I'm going to prove it to you tonight. I got a note two days ago. There's a friend in the country of Kenya, and this is what he said. He said, Pastor Chad, over a year ago, my wife and I watched your services online. And then we liked what we saw, so we watched it again. And then we went to your website, and we read everything we could read about your website. And the Lord started to convict us of sin. And I went to my wife one day when we were watching your service, and I said to her, we need to give our heart to Yeshua tonight. So they did. They gave their heart to Yeshua right there as they were connecting with us and reading all of our material, watching this very service, just like our friends are doing right now around the world. They, got, they gave their heart to Yeshua. They got saved. They got immersed in water locally there. And a few months passed, and they were trying to learn more about Yeshua. They were listening to us. They are trying to be discipled as, as best they could. And the Lord impressed upon the couple that they should start a community group because we talk about community groups all the time. So they said, hey, let's get a couple of our friends, and they started witnessing to everyone in their town. And they got seven people that believe in Yeshua. They got them together in a community group that met in a house, and they did that for seven months. And here's the report. Two weeks ago, they rented their first building. They started a congregation, and last week there were 80 people in the congregation. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for that. You did that. The Lord did that through you. What you do through serving and giving and worshiping and studying with us and linking together with us in partnerships, you did that. You get a piece of that blessing tonight. I want you to receive that blessing because of all that you're part of this family and what we're doing around the world. So Pastor McDonald, we say shalom from Jerusalem. Uh, we hope things are going very well for you in Kenya this week. Hallelujah. We're in our series called Confidence. Turn in your Bibles with me. We're going to go to two main places tonight. I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews, which is where we will begin. And also put your finger in the book of Mark. So Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, and then the book of Mark. And while you're turning there, while you're giving your love offerings, I also want to just say welcome to our friends from Holland tonight. We have some special guests from Holland, some young adults from Holland. Thank you guys for joining us today. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Book of Hebrews, book of Mark. Two weeks ago, we began our series in confidence because I had a, a sense that we needed to hear something. We needed to be challenged as a congregation that we want to become people of conviction. We don't want to think something without digging deep. We don't want to be swayed by the wind. We don't want to be a car that swerves back and forth on the road. We want to think through what is truth, and find it in the Word of God, and be rooted in our convictions, never to revisit those convictions again. When Satan has you revisit your convictions over and over and over, all you're doing is wasting time. That's called drinking the milk over and over. But the way you get to meat, anybody like meat in the house? That's right. Anybody a vegetarian tonight? <laughs> What's after that? Vegans? Nutitarians, anybody a nutitarian? Eat only nuts? <laughs> Act a little nutty? I don't know. If you're a vegetarian, unfortunately, you're not, a, you don't have the prerequisite to become a Levite. Think about it. That's why I always tell my wife I need meat. I wanted to be a Levite. Hallelujah. People of conviction. Hallelujah. In week number two, Pastor Ray did a great job of talking about the confidence that affects our choices. People of conviction that put our confidence in God and his word and watching how that affects our choices. The theme verse for this whole series is from Jeremiah chapter 17. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord whose confidence is in him. And really where we started with this series was the story of Miriam, the mother of Yeshua, 
who, when she was first told by the angel, you're going to be with child, and remember, she's about, what did we say, about 12, 14, 16 years old, so she's a teenager when the angel visits her and says, you're going to be with child, and it's going to be of the Holy Spirit, it's going to be God himself in your womb, that her response wasn't very confident. But a few years into Yeshua's ministry, when she was right at the beginning, and he's 30 years old, and she's maybe 42, 44 years old, at the wedding, they say, oh no, we've run out of wine. We've run out, we don't know what to do. And by that time, she had gained so much confidence in Yeshua, she said to the servants of the house, do whatever he tells you. She went from being scared and concerned and confused to saying, it doesn't matter. Do whatever he tells you to do. And that affected her choice. The confidence affected her choice. Let's begin tonight, Hebrews chapter 3. I was studying this week and I realized that confidence in God is something that we are supposed to have. It's not something we hope to have, it's something we are supposed to have. Hebrews 3 verse 6. But the Messiah is faithful as the son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So if we're supposed to hold with this confidence, what, what is our confidence in? What is our confidence? Well, a few verses later, verse 14 says, we have come to share in the Messiah, if indeed we hold to our original convictions, firmly to the very end of the age. You see, confidence and convictions, they go together. They're linked. Because in your decisions, in your theology, in your doctrine, in your patterns of life, you should have thought through those deeply already, arrived at a rooted convictional place that you never have to revisit, giving you confidence in the way you live. Confidence in the way you think. Not being swayed back and forth by the latest trends or the latest story or the latest YouTube video or the latest tweet that you read or the latest research or the latest document, the documentary that you might have read. Either you think God is the creator or you don't. But once you agree that he is, it's the first domino that hits a lot of other dominoes that fall. Because if he's the real creator, then he's bigger than you, which means we need to submit to him as our father. If you believe he's a father, is he a good father? Is he a loving father? Is he, does he give good gifts to his children? Did he, did he die in our place? Did he pay the price we needed? Where else are you going to go? You see, when you're convicted on these things, you have confidence in the way you live. And we don't have to revisit them over and over. So what is the confidence Hebrews is talking about? Well, it's several things, but, but tonight in verse 14 it said that we get to share in the inheritance of the Messiah. So what is the inheritance of the Messiah Friends, the good news tonight is he inherits all things. So you get to share in that. If you're a believer in Yeshua tonight, I want to give you confidence that you get to share in his inheritance and he inherits all things. That's quite a big inheritance, right? May you be blessed with a good inheritance. One day, unfortunately, your parents may pass away. May you be blessed with a good inheritance. But no inheritance will be as good as that of Yeshua. There are other things that are part of this knowledge of confidence, that we are the head of the house of God, and Yeshua is the head of us, so he is in charge of God's house. He is the great high priest. This chapter says he's greater than Moses, greater, greater than all the patriarchs, Abraham. It says he is our salvation, but there's one more that often gets overlooked in these chapters. I want to read it to you, chapter 4, verse 1 of Hebrews. Therefore... Since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of us be found to have fallen short of it. You see here, there's an additional promise of rest. God is all of these things, and, and we get to inherit all of these wonderful things in the Messiah, but one of the things you get to inherit is rest, an age of rest, what we call the Sabbath age, an age where you won't worry, where you won't be sick, where you won't be stressed. Hello, hallelujah, can I get an amen in that age? I'm pretty tired of this one. Anybody got some stress in their life? Can I see a hand? Seven of you, stress in your life? That's great. My sermon tonight is on lying. That's my sermon. 
is on the line. Come on, there's some stress in the room, is there not? Can I get real for just a minute? Can I tell you about my life? Say, Pastor Chad, you don't have stress. Come on. You're standing up there on that stage. You got TV cameras on. You don't have stress. Come on. You got a nice jacket on. <laughs> well, thank you for the compliment of the jacket. <laughs> I'm about to walk on stage. And my wife texts me. Sweetie, I love you. She's watching. <laughs> she texts me because a water main line blew in our house just a few minutes ago. Our whole house is flooded right now. She's frantically trying to find the plumber. In our, in our broken Hebrew, my mom says on the front row, she got a text that we found the plumber. Hallelujah. Thank you for the update. <laughs> Technology is great. You can get instant updates about your house, what's going on in your family. There's real things, right? Kids are sick, don't have enough money for this, might get fired from your job, don't know where you're going to live. Car broke down. There's some real stress, guys. It really does happen in our life. But we're, we're moving toward an age of rest because it's part of our inheritance. And you might ask, like a normal human being, when will this take place? Our sermon tonight is called God's Speed. And the sermon is not so much about the rest. So I'm going to make sure you turn that page. I'm just using that as a setup for God's speed. Because God doesn't move at our speed, does he? Is it God, when is that, when are you returning Yeshua? When is the age of rest coming? When do I get to inherit these things? Ooh, patience is powerful. And God said, I have my own speed. And that's what we're going to study tonight. We want confidence, not only in the salvation of Messiah, not only that he's paid the price for us, not only that he's a good father, not only that he's the creator of the universe. We want confidence tonight in God's timing. And that's a hard one. I don't know about you, but that one's been hard in my life, and that's why I wanted to talk about it. Our first story tonight in the book of Mark chapter 5, so go ahead and flip there. It's a story of a man named Jairus. He's a synagogue ruler. In Mark chapter 5, verse 22, we hear a little bit about his story, and, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to read his story for you, and I'm going to stop at different parts, and I'm going to interject some thoughts, Okay? So follow with me. Make sure you know when I'm reading the Bible and when I'm making a comment. So you don't think I'm misquoting the Bible. Mark 5, 22. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came, and when he saw Yeshua, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and she'll live. So Yeshua went with him. And a large crowd followed and pressed around him. Pause. Did you notice the confidence in the guy? Came to Yeshua, Yeshua, my daughter's dying. Like, there's no bigger request than the request I'm about to make of you. So if you'll just come, all I need you to do is just touch her. Confidence. This guy had lots of confidence in Yeshua. He didn't say, Yeshua, come and do like a five-hour prayer, uh, prayer intercession over her and anoint her with oil and say every blessing in the Bible, and that would be good also. But the confidence was so high, he didn't even ask for that. All you need to do, Yeshua, please just come and touch her. That's all I need you to do. My confidence is so high in who you are. We continue with the story. So Yeshua went with him, and a large crowd followed and pressed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she actually grew worse. When she heard about Yeshua, she came up behind him in the crowd and she reached out and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I would just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Pause. Look at the confidence in these people. This lady just said, I've been bleeding for 12 years and I'm getting worse and I'm broke because I've tried to fix it and nothing's worked. All I need to do is touch him. You got one person saying, all you need to do is come over here and touch my girl and you got another woman saying, all I need to do is touch you. There's a lot of confidence in that room. But Jairus, the synagogue ruler whose daughter is dying... I'm not trying to prioritize their needs, but it feels like to me, can I just get real? It feels like to me like the one that's dying had a slight advantage over the one that was bleeding. 
Neither are good, neither, both should be healed, but it feels like to me as a human, as a believer reading this passage, the one dying was a little bit above the one bleeding. Would you please come and touch my daughter? Please, she's about to die right now. It's urgent, right now, right now. And Yeshua says, yeah, yeah, we'll go. A couple of steps, a lady touches him, and he stops. Now, you know if you're Jairus, the synagogue ruler, and your daughter's dying, you're like, hello? We got to go. We have to keep moving here. I appreciate the fact that you heard my request, but God, I need you to move right now in my request. And Yeshua said, just give me a moment. I'm, I'm doing something over here because I've got my own speed. It's God's speed. And he, and, he, and he says out to the crowd, we'll read the rest of it. He says, who touched me? Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from all of her suffering. And at once Yeshua realized that power had gone out from him and he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you ask, who touched me? But Yeshua kept looking around to see who had done it, as if he didn't know. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. A couple of important notes. Number one, do you know that God can do a miracle in your life at the same time he's doing a miracle in someone else's? So don't tell him what speed he needs to be on. But God, my problem is so much worse than theirs. I see you moving in someone's life, and that's not fair. My problem is bigger than their problem. Why are you moving in their life, and you're not moving in my life? You know, God is big enough. Where's the confidence? God is big enough to move in both lives at the same time. And he knows that that daughter is struggling and about to die. He's very aware of it. It hasn't slipped his memory. He didn't forget in the last three steps that he took. But inside this amazing story is another amazing story. I'm going to go do this great miracle. I'm so powerful that on my way to do a miracle, I'm going to do another miracle. That's the God I want to serve. That's the confidence I want to put in my God. The imagery of the lady, by the way, is more than just healing. Did you notice it doesn't, doesn't say healing as much as it says freedom? Those of you that are seeking the Lord and in calling on God to move in your life and a breakthrough and a healing and a restoration, whatever it is, the Lord wants to do more than just heal. He wants you free from it. Freedom is different because freedom means your mind doesn't think about it anymore. Healing is when I'm, I'm healed, but I wonder if this might come back. I wonder if it might get worse. I wonder if it might happen again. Freedom says, I can't believe. There is things not even in my life anymore. And that's where we want to be. God brings us to the place of complete Healing and freedom. We'll continue the story. While Yeshua was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter's dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? You see, Yeshua didn't arrive on time, according to their time. He was too slow. He was too late. He didn't understand he didn't come through. He, he may, maybe he shouldn't be trusted now in their mind. Don't bother the teacher anymore, they said. You know, God doesn't always do things when we want him to do it. And the older we get in the Lord, the more we say amen to that. I don't know why he doesn't. I don't know why he likes the last minute stuff. Can I just tell you, he loves it. He thinks it's funny. He thinks it's fun. I don't know what his thing is. More, more often than not, he's stretching the character. That's what he's doing. He, he's, he's pulling and stretching the wineskin a little bit further so you can handle more in the future. He's testing that confidence, that trust, that faith level. We've got several in the house tonight who might have been asking, when is God going to break through on this business deal? It's great when you know the congregation because you know who's sitting in the congregation. So you can use an example from somebody that you just looked at in the congregation. 
When is he going to break through in the business deal? I got to have it right now. And he comes through at just the last second. Right? When am I going to get married? Ha. Ah. See, that's a, that's a weird example. Yeah, except for the fact that there's someone here tonight who just got engaged. I'm not going to say who they are. They're in the house, though. Congratulations, by the way. You could ask, when am I, God, how long do I have to wait for this? Where is this guy? Would you hurry up and hit him on the head already? Wake him up. What's going on? But God doesn't move at our speed. He, he has God's speed. And they say to him, don't bother the teacher. She's dead. Leave him alone. Don't bother him. He doesn't need to come anymore. And then there's a great verse. It says, Yeshua, overhearing what they said to Jairus, looked at him and said, don't be afraid. Just believe. What is Yeshua saying? This is what he's really saying. Hey, Jairus, remember that confidence you started with? All I had to do was come and touch her. Remember that confidence? Don't lose that. When all your friends are telling you he's not going to come through, he doesn't do it that way, he'll never break through, he doesn't move in your life, he doesn't do that anymore, he's not powerful like he used to be, don't lose your confidence in God just because someone else lost theirs. Can I say that as a key phrase tonight? Do not lose confidence in God just because others around you might have, but hold firmly to your original convictions. Hold firmly, because why? Because that's where the inheritance is. As long as you hold firmly to the original convictions, you get to participate in the inheritance of God. Jairus, don't lose your confidence. All I had to do was touch. Remember that? Stay right there. Stay on that original conviction. This is similar to the book of Job. You know, Job's friends didn't, didn't like what God was doing or allowing in, jo in Job's life. And they said, just curse him already. He's obviously not going to come through. He doesn't care about you. And Job said, I'm never going to curse God. And Job anchored himself in the conviction that his father was good and loving. And of course, the end of the story is God comes through in a mighty way for Job, even after a very tragic scenario. But sometimes the friends around us are going to try to pull us down and strip our confidence from who God really is. And what he's saying to Jairus is, Jairus, don't lose the confidence. Didn't you just see me heal that lady? I'm the same one. I'm just not doing it when you want. It doesn't mean I'm not doing it. It just means I'm not doing it when you want. And I think that's the challenge for us. If I can bring some application tonight, it's so challenging to stay away from that doubt and unbelief, the timing. And I would say to you tonight, just be challenged to never let the timing be a separation between you and God. He loves you more than you'll ever know. He's, that we've, we've said it often, no one's working harder for you than God. The Bible says Yeshua is ever interceding in the heavenly places for you. Ever interceding. Every day interceding. He's working to build a place for you in the age to come. He's working to defeat the evil one in your life, to set us free. He's working harder than you'll ever work for yourself. Don't ever let timing separate you from God. Or his power. So after his friends say, leave the Messiah alone, and Yeshua overhears it, and he, he gives that, that boost of encouragement to, to Jairus, he says, D don't lose heart here. Just believe. We continue the story. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jairus, Yeshua saw all of the commotion with people crying and, and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all of this commotion and noise and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. You see, what they missed there was a promise. He just told them the promise. What's all the noise about? Say, what? This guy can't tell what we're doing. Is he thick in the head? He doesn't know what a, what a funeral looks like and grieving looks like. Where is this guy from? And Yeshua says, no, no, no. She's not dead. There's the promise, and they all missed it. Everybody missed it. He just said, she's not dead. And nobody grabbed the promise. 
They just laughed. Ha, ha, ha. You don't know what you're talking about, you crazy man. Don't ever miss the promise of God because he didn't show up in your timing. These poor people missed it. They, did, they didn't catch that Yeshua just told them, you're in for a treat today, friends, because she's not dead. And all the physicians said, no, she is dead. Well, great. One of those two statements is going to not be true here in a minute. Guess which side of the fence I would like to be on? We continue the reading. After he put all of them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and he went in where the child was, and he took her by the hand, and he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. You know why they were astonished? Because they didn't hear the promise a few minutes earlier. They should have heard it. They should have grabbed onto it. They should have put their confidence in what Yeshua had just told them. They missed that part of it. And yet, even though that's what Jairus asked for, would you please come and heal my daughter before she dies? Remember, that was the request. Would you heal her before she dies? Yeshua said, I'll go with you. I didn't promise the whole before she dies part. Because that's not God's speed. I'm going to move at my own speed because I'm going to do something bigger than what you asked for. Ooh, that's a good promise. Somebody grab that one tonight. I'm going to do something bigger than what you asked for. You asked for me to just heal her. I'm going to resurrect her. How about that? How about I go above what you asked? How about if I go far beyond what you ask me to do? How about Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21? Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the congregation and in the Messiah Yeshua to all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's not just more than, it's far more than. It's not just far more than, it's far more abundantly than. It's not just far more abundantly, it's beyond. Not just some of the things, but all of the things. Not just what you can ask, but what also you can think. You see, Yeshua didn't move at Jairus' speed because he had something bigger in mind. And I would hate for any of us to cut off a blessing from God because we let the timing separate us from God's plan. Jairus now has his name in the Bible for all time. Because Yeshua resurrected his daughter. But he could have complained about it. He could have been one of the ones that laughed. He could have criticized Yeshua, you know. In the story of Jairus, it appears that Yeshua was too slow and he was too late. 2 Peter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness, but instead he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Do you know that's not the only story where we have to look at God's timing and, and try to put our mind around the God's speed timing of these things? You know, our friend Lazarus is a famous story. John chapter 11. It says, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus was now laying sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Yeshua, Lord the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Yeshua said, this sickness will not end in death. There's the promise. He just said it again. This sickness will not end in death. And to their dismay, even as much as he loves Miriam and Martha and Lazarus, he waits two more days before he leaves. By the time he gets there, he, Lazarus has been in the grave Three and four days, depending on your reading and how you read it, how you see it. They're giving up hope now. We're going to continue reading here in a second. But he promised him he wouldn't die, just like Jairus' daughter. He said he won't die. No, it is for the God's glory, so that God's son may be glorified through this. Verse 11, John 11, 11. And after he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. Second promise. Verse 17. On his arrival, Yeshua found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. 
Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. Why did it take two days to go two miles? And many Jews had come to Martha and Miriam's house to comfort them in the loss of their brother. See, it's, he's gone. When Martha heard that Yeshua was coming, she went out to meet him. But Miriam stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Yeshua, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. I wonder where she learned that from. Miriam, mother of Yeshua, do whatever he tells you. Now we have Martha saying, I know the Father will do whatever you ask. Just ask for him to come back to life. And Yeshua said to her, Martha, your brother will rise again. Third time. Three promises that Lazarus was not going to die. And of course, as you know the story, Yeshua goes on and fulfills his promise. He, they roll back the stone and he, he says to Lazarus, Lazarus, it's time. Come on out. It's, it's God's speed. I'm here at God's speed. Now's the timing when the Son of Man will be glorified, just like Jairus' daughter, just like the issue of blood. Why did it take 12 years, friends? I don't know. Why did Jairus' daughter have to die first? I don't know. Why did Lazarus have to be in the grave four days when it was only two miles away? I don't know. But God has a speed, and I can tell you this, it's not my speed. And I'm still trying to master this one. I think those of us in the room are on this journey together. We might all be trying to master this one. They were astonished at what he did. But even after this great miracle, do you know they began to criticize Yeshua? What? He just raised somebody from the dead. Look at John 11, verse 37. Same story. But some of them said, this is after the resurrection, some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Really? That's the response. He shows up and resurrects someone from the dead, and instead of saying, thank you, O oh, great and mighty master, O oh, king and creator of the universe, it's amazing what you just did. Instead of saying that, they criticize Yeshua. They criticize, hear me, here it is tonight. They criticized Yeshua's timing. They put a separation between themselves and God because of timing. These people didn't understand how many people were going to be saved at what they just saw. How many people were entering the kingdom because of what they just saw. They didn't understand that. They criticized the timing of Yeshua and friends tonight. I want to challenge us to this thought. Don't ever criticize God's timing. Why? Because time is one of the things that he created. It's subject to him. It's a creation just like we are, just like the animals and the earth. There, there was no time until he said, I'm, I've got this new idea, I want to call it time. And then he set time into motion. Time is a creation that has to listen to the creator. That's why he's never nervous about it. That's why at certain points of the Bible, he just says to the sun, I'm going to ask you to stop there just for a minute. Just stop. And the sun says, yes, sir. Yes, great master. You created me. I'm going to listen to you. And I'm just going to stand here for a minute until you tell me to continue. And the moon just stops. And the light in Egypt just stopped. Because all of creation listens to the creator. Including time. Because time personified as a creation. It listens to him. When he says stop, it stops. When he says go, it goes. When he says slow down, it slows down. And when he says speed up, it speeds up. That's why we don't know the time of the end of the age. Because we're waiting patiently and powerfully for God's speed in these things. And here's the warning from Scripture. Isaiah chapter 5. Listen to this. This caught my attention. Woe to those who draw sin along with cords of deceit and wickedness as with cart ropes. To those who say, let God hurry. Let him hasten his work so that we can see it. The plan of the Holy One of Israel. Hey, let his plan approach now. Let it come into my view so that we can know it. 
They're criticizing God's timing. They're saying, we're not going to trust God unless he does it the way we want. We're not going to put our trust and confidence in God unless he does it in the timing that we want. And they've separated themselves from God because of timing that we may see, that we may know. Our prayers might sound like that. God, do this for me so that I may know. Be careful there. That's, that's a slippery little place to be in. God doesn't have to do anything so that you may know. Why? Because God has already done everything so that you may know. This was the conviction I made as a teenager. I've been following the Lord since age six. As a teenager, I had a, a deeper new revelation with God and I and I committed myself to him in a fresh way. And, and I made some convictional decisions, some declarations, if you will. And one of them was this one. And it's lasted me my whole life so far. I said to the Lord, you have already done everything you ever need to do for me. If you never do another thing for me, it's okay. Because you've already done everything I need. And making that convictional stance... Believing with confidence in my heart that that statement was true helps me through times when I don't understand. And I remind myself, it's not my job to understand. And God doesn't move at my speed. He has God's speed. That's when he moves. And usually when he moves at God's speed, the miracle you're about to get is bigger than the one you asked for. Because he does far more exceedingly abundantly beyond we would hate to cut off a grand miracle for something smaller. I read a leadership book one time called Good to Great. You know, the enemy of great is not bad, right? The enemy of great is good. Because good makes you settle and stop. When you could be holding on for the great, the greatness of God, the all-powerful nature of God. We learn these stories from Jairus, from Job, from Miriam and Martha and Lazarus, the woman with the issue of blood. Their confidence was in the Lord. I close with Deuteronomy 23. Because in the end of our walk, friends, this verse is where we want to be. This is what we want the description of our life to look like. Deuteronomy 23, 14 says, For the Lord your God moves about in your camp to protect you and to deliver you from all of your enemies. Your camp must be holy so that he will not see among you anything indecent and turn away from you. That's where we want to live where God moves in our camp. He moves in our family. He moves in the Kela to protect us, to deliver us, to give good gifts to us, to do miracles for us, to bestow love on us, to hand us an inheritance of Yeshua. And when does it come? When we have confidence and we hold unswervingly to the convictions that are in the Bible. Confidence in the Lord. Tonight, friends, prayer team, I'm going to call you forward. Please come quickly. We're challenge, challenging ourselves to put our full confidence in God today, not just in his creation and not just in his salvation, but also in his timing. Timing is tough for us. Have you ever criticized or complained against God's timing in your life? Have you ever said to God, why are you so slow? Why are you not listening? Why are you not moving? My sense is probably most of us in the room have battled some of that. And many of us in the room might even be battling these challenges tonight. Maybe there's issues of life, worries, stresses, unanswered prayers. We need a breakthrough. We need something to be fixed And yet the way we need to pray tonight is in full confidence that God will do it at his speed. 
It's not that he's not listening. It's not that he's not moving. It's not that he doesn't see what you need. He wants you to ask, but ask with confidence that God will move at his speed and he will give you a greater miracle than even the miracle that you asked for. Can you stand to your feet as we close in prayer? Our prayer team is now available for any and every reason. If you need a word of encouragement, if you need a breakthrough tonight, our team is ready to pray with you while we worship. If you're comfortable lifting your hands, just take a position to receive something from God. Yeshua, you have already done everything we will ever need you to do. You have already proven yourself that you never need to prove anything to us again. Today we want to move from the milk to the meat. We want to eat the richness of solid food in your word tonight. Would you help us to grow and trust in your timing? Where we have ever complained against you, forgive us, Lord, in the name of Yeshua. Where we have ever said in our heart, God's not listening, please forgive us. God, if we've ever complained against comparing what you've done in others' lives to what you're doing in our life, forgive us. We know tonight that you can do a miracle in someone else's life while you do a miracle in ours. For all of these things, Lord, would you forgive us? Bring us back into right standing with you. Bring us confidence in who you are. May we have that original confidence of Jairus to say all you need to do is touch. The confidence of the women with the blood that just said all I need to do is touch him. The confidence of Miriam that says just do whatever he tells you. The confidence of Martha that simply says even now I know whatever you say will be done. So we impart that new confidence on us as a community. Thank you.